For the last two weeks, we have been dreaming and scheming together, haven't we? We've been thinking a little bit about what it means as we live into the beginning of 2013, and it's the end of the month. How are you doing on those resolutions? I hate to say I told you so, but do you remember the sermon where I preached, forget your resolutions because they don't work because you're just going to fail? Do you remember that? So why do resolutions in the beginning? And so what we started to do is we started talking about let's do blessings instead. And I'm delighted that there are already blessings in our blessing jar. So if you haven't yet made the opportunity, you can draw on something and write your blessing and drop it in there. And don't forget to be keeping track during the week and bring them and throw them in our blessing jar. And we're going to see what God is doing in our community. I want to say hi to those that are worshiping online with us. Last Sunday, uh, you might recall, I was with um, several hundred youth from four states in um, the region of North Carolina. And... um, they were amazed that we have the opportunity to um, interact online. And so I'm hoping that they are online with us and not crashing our server. So if they are, hey, um, it's good to see you, kind of. And um, we will be nice, I hope. And this is your time to go get communion stuff if you haven't already. They, they liked the thought of having M&Ms and Coke for communion. So I told them they could do that and that, that I wouldn't know. Um, I am wondering with you, how far do you feel we are all going to need to go this year to see the answers and find the answers that we're looking for? So many of you tell me throughout the weeks and throughout the year what you're searching for, what what you yearn for, and and I don't know if you come to me for answers or if you come to me just because no one else will listen to you or if you come to me because everybody you've worn everybody else out. I, I really don't know, but I want to share with us as a community what are we going to do as we seek those answers together. Are we going to proactively do it? Are you just going to give up along the way? Are you, are you going to let somebody fall by the wayside? B.C. Forbes is not someone that I would normally quote in a sermon, um, but I'm going to this week. He, he, his writings this week reminded me of something about my own personal search, and, and I came across this quote. The be-all and end-all of life should not be to get rich, but to enrich the world. Mr. Forbes, as you might know, is the Forbes, that guy, But before he started a financial empire and a publishing empire, he was just a boy. And and he was a boy that was born in Scotland in 1880. And um, he was born to a father who worked two jobs, a tailor and a beer shop owner. Not too bad, I think, ways to make your money. And his mother, and and, um, B.C., as a young child, would herd cattle for extra money. And um, he worked as a shoeshine boy, and he helped to harvest crops even before he found what he had been looking for. It was only after he taught himself shorthand that he began to write. He found writing to be tedious, and so he taught himself a shorthand. And it was in that moment that he found his gift, this creative, insightful coverage that he gave us before his death of of business, which before was always boring and still is, you know, kind of boring. And um, he had this way of, of creatively engaging the people and entertaining us with his journalistic skills. He knew that in our search for something more at the end, we find that we need to enrich the world. And so I wonder with you tonight, was he reading Isaiah as he penned that quote? I'm pretty sure he was. I am God. And I have called you to live right and well. I have taken responsibility for you, God says. I have kept you safe, God says. I have set you among my people to bind them to me. And and provided you as a lighthouse to the nations to make a start at bringing people into the open, into light, opening blind eyes, releasing prisoners from dungeons, emptying the dark prisons. 
God's servant, you see, will establish justice through prophetic words and acts of compassion, not just in your own life, but in lives all over the globe. Literally to enrich the world, regardless of what you get back. It seems to me that the answer that is out there somewhere that we seek for is really embedded in these words from the prophet Isaiah. In all of our search, in all of our longing, all of our questioning, all of our filling up our lives with everything else but God will never lead us to this answer about what more shall we do, about our purpose, unless we start acting with compassion. It's living a life of blessing. Being God's servant in the world. And we have such a great model, don't we, in Christ, who lived with us. You know, it, it, it seems so simple. So why do we complicate it? We do, don't we? This, this summer, on a Sunday, um, against a lot of political pressure, I might add, I suspended worship for the evening. Do you remember that? And we went to see Prometheus in a movie theater and called it worship. Now, some of you decided it wasn't worship and so you didn't show up. I'm sure by now you've seen the movie because you know it's a really important movie or I wouldn't have suspended worship for it. And that's where our film clip comes from this evening. It's Prometheus. It applies to us. You see, this group of scientists, they, they travel across space many, many years. And they're traveling across space in search of beings that they believe are their makers. They think that they have found the answer that they have been looking for and they are willing to do whatever it takes. They too are searching for answers that they think will fill up that God-shaped hole that is so inside of each one of us. And you know, we hear that response that Dr. Holloway gives to the android. You know... I, 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 that he'll do whatever it takes. That the android says that the entire mission is at, at the expense, I will say, of a trillion dollars is so that humans can meet their maker. A trillion dollars, right? That's a, that's a deal, right? To meet your maker, would you not spend a trillion dollars? I don't know, I think I'd feed the world, but maybe you'd spend a trillion dollars meeting the maker. And um, they can ask questions. Who of us has not wanted to start pinning questions when I get to heaven? The first thing I'm going to do, right? Fill in the blank. I'm going to ask about chapped lips and fire ants, right? But we all have whatever it is that we're going to ask. And, 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 and so they're going to spend a trillion dollars to, to meet their maker and ask the questions that have been deep down to discover why the makers created them in the first place. Why am I here? Why? And, and um, he admits to, to David, the, the android, the robot, that the human made the robots because they could. And even David responds that this is a disappointing answer. Are we just living life because we can? Is there not something more that we're called to be? And so then David asks, how far would you go? to get what you all came all this way for. And Dr. Holloway, in a very human moment, I might add, a very disappointing moment from my view, says anything and everything. We might think in the beginning, that's really good stuff right there. That's serious devotion, Suzanne. We should all be anything and everything. Yes, go, Dr. Holloway. I'm surely he's a Christ figure. Commitment to the cause. Too bad it's so horribly misplaced. Seems that we as a race will do anything and everything except, of course, listen to what God asks us to do and to be the hands and feet of Christ. We don't have to spend a trillion dollars, it seems to me. I mean, maybe we do, maybe you do, maybe I do, I don't know. And, and some churches will spend thousands pl placing people on street corners. You know who they are. They follow me at Sundance Square. They seem to know that I'm a minister, and, and they hand out tracts, right, with a list of, of what you can do to get to heaven. And it seems so easy. It seems so simple. But in the end, it's pretty clear cut. And all of the searching is in vain because God's love is universal. 
That's scary for us. We don't want God to love everybody. But all we have to know is that that love was manifested in the personhood of Christ. And we profess in this place to follow Christ. And Christ said, love the world. Jesus answered many of our questions. He walked with humanity all over Israel, performing acts of justice, mercy, hope. And yet, rather than rely, I guess, on his magnificent example of what we could do in the world, we seek elsewhere. We fill our bodies up with drugs and alcohol or technology or other people instead of spending the time figuring out what God is really asking us to do. God made humanity in the image of God. I've said it to you before. Look at the person next to you. Go ahead. This is a mo- turn. Hello. I'm looking at you. I can see you. Turn and look. That's a little bit of God sitting next to you. You are made in the image of God. Preparing us to hear the call of Isaiah this evening. Did you know when you came tonight that the answer was right there in front of you? And when we forget that call is when our souls keep searching, I think. Could it be so simple, really? We choose to keep looking elsewhere, except where we might truly encounter the God who made us in the eyes of the poor, in the eyes of the hungry, in the eyes of those who have not yet heard or seen, those who have not been told, those who still live in the pain of whatever it is that holds them down into chains. Could it be that simple? Have we forgotten that we are called to enrich the world? Isaiah points to us as the embodiment of God's vision. That's some serious stuff. I I mean, I don't know if you understand what that means. Isaiah says, you, Kelly, and you, Annalisa, and you, Avis, and you, Karen, and you, Kyle, and you, Rebecca, and you, Stuart, all of you, you are the embodiment of God's vision here and now. And yet, being chosen is not an individual possession. It's not something that we keep for ourselves. It is a gift to the world. It is a blessing. It is a reminder about light and justice to the world so that God is the one who is glorified in the chaos and the creativity of what we make. The God who created the cosmos, Isaiah says, stretched out the skies and laid out the earth and all that grows from it, who breathes life into earth's people and makes them alive with his own life. Isaiah says, God, this God didn't keep beauty as a private possession, but was shared with humanity so that we might also share that beauty. The kind of beauty that gives us life and light, breath to all, not just me and not just you. It's so easy to personalize it, isn't it? But that's the answer that we're seeking. As God's breath is upon us, so we now are sent. This is the God of long ago the God of beginnings, to reveal that God continues to make all things new. Our God summons us to break into the world, to spring forth acts of liberation, renewal, and our model is Christ. What on earth and in heaven and the cosmos are we waiting for? And you know, I had Kelly stop at verse 9 in Isaiah 42 because I wanted, sorry, Kelly, to be, to have you wait to this moment to hear the next line, verse 10. It's, it's one that you know so well, but I hope now you'll see it in a new context. It, it's so familiar. It's a call for all creation. Sing to God a new song. The introduction of the liberating servant of God, whom God delights and pronounces good. That's you and me, by the way. With with whom God has charged to bring justice requires nothing less than a new song to every corner of the world. Creation cannot contain itself. And we cannot be kept down. We must sing along. We must call all to the table of our God. 
We must not stop until the blessings overflow. Alleluia. Over and over. Alleluia. Over and over. Alleluia. Amen. See, I catch you with these arms that hold me back against this wall. Release me from these chains that hold me fast. You see, there's a light at the end that I'm running to. You hold my hand, then I'll show you.